Musician Jackie Leven, the man and his music in Artery. Jackie Levin. Uh, I'm from the Kingdom of Fife. I'm actually from Kirkcaldy and uh, today we're in what I consider to be my little glen. This is the Levin Valley and um, we're halfway between the towns of Leslie to that side and Markinch. We're actually on an old railway line which was the railway line which um, ran between these two towns. So for me this is a kind of very important location because it's where the, the little steam train came in and stopped right outside my house and let me know in some mysterious way that there was life elsewhere on the planet and I was going to have to go and find that life. I come from Purton, where the river leaf and runs. Mills are gone now, the reservoirs glinting the sun. And I live for a town. Live in sorrow on the road. Uh, I grew up in Leslie in the fifties. Um, my father was um, a Cockney, and my mum was um, a, a Romany Geordie. And although I'm Scottish myself, um, this was quite an exotic combination of peoples uh, in this small town at that time. So I found it really quite tough at school, uh, but it taught me lots of entertaining skills, which um, hold good for me to this day. Um, it taught me uh, how to be entertaining with my school friends and also how to clipe on people to good effect. Well, these, these all were tough towns, and um, an interesting thing happened uh, to the small towns of the Leven Valley, uh, which was uh, the, the new town of Glenrothes grew up and gave tremendous focus to the macho tendency of um, all of my schoolmates. And um, I found this very intriguing, not really being part of it, just the, the whole the gang rivalry thing between the towns and this new town. And it actually gave me a kind of respite uh, in my own way because the focus kind of went off um, me being quite an exotic person and allowed me to get on with other things that were beginning to matter to me like uh, a growing love of music and a growing love of poetry. <laughs> my mum had a great love of uh, the uh, black American blues and, uh, and therefore in our home quite unusually we um, we're always listening to people like Lightning Hopkins and these wonderful old blues guys. And um, I was further delighted uh, by this music and, and an affinity with my mum uh, liking this music because my, my dad wasn't keen on it at all and he'd, he'd come home from work and um, come in the house and say, why is it whenever I come home there's black men shouting in my house? And this, this always delighted me. When I was about uh, 12, I asked my father if uh, we could go into Kirkcaldy and if he'd buy me a guitar. And um, I built myself up for weeks thinking that we were going to have a huge battle about this, but uh, he just said, yes, of course. And um, I've uh, had a kind of a true and deep respect for him ever since then. It was a, it was a great thing. And um, one thing about my guitar playing is that uh, I never learned how to tune it. I just assumed that everyone had to find their own kind of tuning, so I play in, in this tuning which is unique to me in the world. Where we are 
now now is um, a castle called Ravenscraig at a place called Erdizer, just outside Kirkcaldy. And this is where I used to come uh, in my early teens on my own to, I guess, to contemplate. I used to sit here on this beach below us and uh, I can remember wondering what I was thinking about. And I think um, an important part of me was probably organising itself in the understanding that I was going to get out into the rest of the world and uh, take my music with me. Uh, but it was also organising what that music was going to be. Uh, it was organising a mix of that black American blues, the, the West Coast American music of the time, and, and the old songs of Fife as well, just, just all mixing together inside me and, and waiting until it was time to go. And I'm the wanderer Drinking from a fountain in the square I'm the wanderer met some wonderful guys in Dorset um, when we were all squatting farmhouses in Dorset in the um, uh, mid-70s and we agreed to get together in 77 in London and we wanted to make a, a, a band which was kind of uh, fierce on stage but beautiful on record and um, always playing really excellent songs. I dare say we were the kind of the, the archetypal wild band in many ways. Um, Dave, our drummer, was, um, it was said of him that he was the only man in the world that could fall upstairs. We had a lot of fun and, uh, and the guys were um, pretty wild. We got a wild reputation, unfortunately. And as you may know yourself, once you get one of those wild reputations, funnily enough, you start acting it out. And it didn't suit us, actually, because um, we were a, a bunch of good fun guys looking for a very good laugh, but, but we weren't a wild or dangerous bunch of people, really. The main pressure of being in a band is the pressure of spending your whole life waiting. You're waiting for the plane, you're, you're, you're waiting in the van, you're waiting in the bus, you're waiting in your hotel room. And um, not only that, after months and months of waiting around, you go home and you don't even recognise your own room. You think, who's been in my room and left all these stupid ornaments and stuff? So, yeah, there is that pressure to, to alleviate the pressure, really, and um, I think it's almost true to say that um, drugs are an inevitability, especially for younger bands who just have no experience of coping with uh, the pressure of, of nothing, of nothingness on the road. <laughs> It was unpredictable, unfortunately. Um, uh, I was finding the pressure of the whole thing um, pretty serious, and I was uh, also writing songs that were disturbing myself, never mind my audience. So um, people kind of gave me a wide berth just in case, and um, I was also going through an extreme aggressive uh, phase, I, I dare say. I think probably if what was happening for me at the end of Doll by Doll was I was in my last stages of boyhood but um, couldn't find a way to become a, a man and, and actually just grow up. Like young Irish men in English bars The song of home betrays us Call mother a lonely Call mother a lonely field And like truthful glances we exchange Song of home betrays us Ooh. And like letters written in despair Never to be over 
Well, after uh, Doe by Doe made um, five albums, uh, we were nevertheless coming to the end of our shelf life the way that uh, one does. And um, that was a kind of a sad time, but we'd, we just uh, we'd had enough of driving up and down the country to no avail. Uh, and then, unfortunately for me, um, I was uh, attacked one night uh, in North London when I'd been working in a studio uh, in, in just off the Pentonville Road. Uh, I decided to walk home late one night from the studio after working up till about three in the morning. And everyone in the studio said, don't do that. It's a stupid thing to do around here. But uh, of course, being a kind of Scots hero type person to myself, I decided it would be okay. So uh, I basically got mugged um, in an unprovoked attack in the street in, in London. And uh, after that, um, I, uh, I couldn't sing or speak for almost two years. Basically, I had my larynx nearly entirely destroyed and, um, and uh, had uh, quite a lot of other injuries. So that was um, a painful time for me when uh, I actually came to the end of one huge part of my life and, uh, and found myself living in a world, a kind of a world of silence. Well, one of the things that happened in this attack and uh, not being able to, to sing or speak um, for uh, some considerable time was that I actually found I couldn't even listen to, to music or the human voice because I'd never noticed that all my life um, my vocal cords had um, expanded and constricted as I listened to music or even other people speaking. It's just a thing I'd naturally done as a singer. So I found that I didn't even want to listen to the human voice at all. So I ended up living in a, a world of, of almost um, complete silence on my own in, in one room basically. And um, uh, that was, uh, I suppose, a really scarring experience because I just kind of lost touch uh, with the human race and, um, and just ended up in, in a serious form of isolation. I was also in a lot of uh, extreme physical pain, which um, the doctor I had at the time uh, didn't seem to recognise. So in the end, I uh, turned to taking um, heroin, which is often called uh, the drug of despair. And I actually found it very useful just in terms of pain management. I mean, that is the idea of the drug. And for me, it worked in that limited respect. However, uh, <clears throat> my girlfriend at the time kind of became an addict in sympathy with me. And um, the understanding that we had to, to stop doing what we were doing came when uh, my girlfriend was, was still modeling at that time. And we saw this um, billboard advert that she'd done for um, Selfridges. It was an advert for jeans. And um, I said to her, look, Carol, there's one of those uh, billboards for those, that jeans advert you've just done. So she said, oh, yes. She said, let's go, let's go over the road and have a look at it. This was in London. So we went over the road and we're looking at this billboard advert and someone had written beside uh, um, the eyes in Carol's head, heroin addiction is written in her eyes. So um, there wasn't just the thing of losing the, the esteem, there was the fact that it was becoming very, very obvious, which was uh, more than I could bear. I kind of decided I wanted my life back and that um, the, the deep and the core of the pain, as it were, was over. And uh, so I went to see um, a new doctor who was also a homeopath, uh, who sa said to me, he didn't feel that I was ever going to cure myself of the addiction that I'd acquired to heroin by um, means that existed, by going into programs that existed. So he suggested that I um, start doing a couple of therapies like Chinese acupuncture, and um, uh, psychic healing. And I found that once I started those particular treatments that um, I uh, was free of the symptoms of, of addiction within three weeks. And um, I still uh, really didn't have any singing career in prospect. So 
Uh, speaking to this doctor again, he said, why don't you formalize this methodology that I think you've stumbled across and, uh, and make it into a proper program and start working with other people as you've got nothing better to do with your life. CORE is an acronym for Courage to Stop, Order in Our Lives, Release from Addiction, Entry into New Life. Um, the project began to look like something that um, could be viable for a, a hell of a lot of people with all kinds of addiction problems. And so the time came when I had to make a decision as to whether or not I wanted to get into that, that kind of work. And, um, and I decided I did. And um, as, I, as I was saying, the, the funding came fast and furious and we had a, a lot of great luck. Um, Princess Di became interested in the project and became very much our champion. And um, uh, we suddenly had major premises in uh, central London and the interest of an awful lot of other projects, uh, not of a similar nature, but, but who are interested in things like the use of acupuncture and addiction. So we're suddenly in the forefront of um, addiction approaches um, in London and therefore in Europe. There's a wonderful phrase which is the joke, the threat and the obvious and when the core trust started we were considered a joke. Then established projects um, said well you know this is dangerous stuff but uh, now of course uh, what we do is just obviously the correct thing. If we should meet in Glasgow by chance on a rainy day Let's sit and drink in a damn good bar Till evening comes out to play And there are things I don't want to talk about Things I don't want to see Twisted spires and lonely buyers Winter spray, winter spray. I was a single father. Those were real harsh times. I remember losing my baby every time I hear a church bell chime. I was a single father. I just can't complain Got a heart full of headstones As I step down As I step down From the train From the train I suddenly noticed um, after the core trust was established and I could tell that really barring tremendous accidents it was going to be okay that uh, I hadn't been to Scotland for a long time and in fact um, I'd been away from Scotland effectively for about 20 years apart from forays up here as, as a, a failed rock star or, or in other guises. So it occurred to me as well I simply didn't know the west coast of Scotland and so I came up uh, to the west coast and the first place that really struck me is, is here by Kilchurn Castle at Loch Awe on the way to Oban. And I kind of, for the first time in my adult life, got a real appreciation of, of what a magnificent country this was. And it was the beginning of, of a reawakening of myself, I suppose as an adult, for the first time. One of the most singular things that happened to me in Oban was um, uh, I thought the bars were so fantastic at that time when I first started coming back up. It was great to be amongst really fierce people again and um, uh, I discovered myself singing in those bars and um, first of all just singing old Scot songs but then slowly and kind of tentatively singing the songs that I was writing in Oban. So um, that was a, a great way to get back into believing in myself as a performer. I don't think I ever really write about myself. I put myself in the songs deliberately, so the song has an image which is central to the way that the, the listener listens, so they can see me in the song. I don't really have that much connection, even if events in the songs are events from my life. 
uh, they still just come from a kind of archetypal pool of events which are common to us all. So I'm never really that much in the song. The fairy man has hands of stone. The real place of uh, words in songs, I think, is the cadence. And that's something that's not particularly recognised, I don't think, by the listeners, and certainly not by critics. Um, critics are very concerned, as, as are the people that buy my records, for instance, by what the words mean. Uh, the words in themselves don't have to particularly mean much. It's the actual cadence. And cadence is what's important in poetry as well. I love um, Russian poetry and I love American poetry. And I think they're incredibly similar. And what's similar is the cadence. Obviously, the words take you into the images once again. And the images are where we all live. We all live in images all the time. That's all we have is images. So poetry is the conductor of images. The reason that I'm not a, a pop star is I never wanted to be one when I was young. It was never my ambition, it was the travelling thing and uh, the reporting, in a way, of, of what I saw through songs. And I think now that uh, I'm in my 50th year, uh, I hope that I'm moving into some kind of um, elder kind of position within music and, and I like that, I feel very comfortable with it. So I would hope to be making good records right through to my 70s and beyond. Describing what your music's like and who you are within your own music is, um, is a real difficult thing and there's nothing more boring than hearing a musician say, well, my music's a bit like this and it's a bit like that. And I always think of this in terms of uh, London taxi drivers. They always say, well, what sort of music is it when they see you've got a guitar? And as soon as you start saying, it's a bit like this and it's a bit like that, they immediately start falling asleep. So uh, the English papers have decided that the music I do is Celtic soul. I don't quite know why they've said that or what they mean by it, but I'm quite comfortable with that. So now when taxi drivers say to me, what kind of music do I do? I say, well, it's Celtic soul. And when they say, well, what's that like? I say, well, it's a bit rocky and it's a bit bluesy. I'm just a man and I'm on my own. I hear strange news from another star. Just a man and I'm on my own. Bye. 